but you also have to take into account our transportation people have to look at that. Can they handle additional transportation on those days? And stay within the requirement from the state that transportation not exceed 67% of the bus capacity, which in some cases requires a second route. So they have to plan for that. Food service has to, as you noted, has to plan for having additional students in the building. One of the struggles we have, we talked about it related to if employees have to isolate or quarantine. Right now, we are, we are down more than 50 food service employees because of vacancies. Now, that includes some number of quarantined or isolated food service employees, but it's in excess of 50 that we don't have at work, and the majority of that are unfilled positions. We are short 70 bus drivers. We would have a huge issue right now if this were a regular year. In fact, we would likely be coming back to you to ask for some things that would incentivize uh, folks to sign up to drive. We're, we're having a great challenge with that, but they've been able to operate the buses, they've operated on time, but again, they're running reduced loads because of the schedule we're operating. So they have to be able to calculate out, can they run these increased schedules? So there, all these things are happening both independently but simultaneous with other work, and they're coming back to us and saying, here's our finding here, here's our finding here, then we critique that and say, well, have we looked at doing this? Have we looked at doing that? So it's a process to make sure that we don't step off into something we cannot do and cannot do, most importantly, cannot do safely. Because we're not, we are, again, we're not going to recommend anything to you nor act in a way that does not hold in its highest regard the safety of our students and our employees. And one thing that is constantly I'm hearing is those that those teachers and students that chose virtual meant they did not want to be in the schools. And those teachers that chose traditional and students want to be at school. And so, and I would take it that we want them to be in school as well. It's just we are looking at, on buses, we're looking at the guidelines that we're held accountable when placing those students 67% capacity. Is that correct? Uh, um, and I'd look at it perhaps a little bit differently. We all want students to be in school five days a week. That's what's best for students. Uh, and, and parents who chose uh, virtual, they chose that they really made a choice that they might not be physically present in school all year. They, might, they would be virtual all year. But the other thing to remember is those who didn't choose that, who either chose or because of other issues were compelled to choose to be in person, they made that choice inside a plan that said these are the things we would do to ensure your safety when you're in person. So I think there are, there are numbers, in fact I know there are numbers within that that wish to do five days without regard, that, they, that that's what they would choose or wish to do. There are others that made that choice knowing certain safety protocols were in place. And, and equally important is our employees took on this year's responsibilities and agreed to carry them out knowing here's our plan and here are the protocols we have in place for your safety. So while it is true they did choose that, they chose it with some parameters in place. Parameters we believe are important to the health and safety of everyone. And were those parameters in place when they were making that choice? They made the choice between virtual and between uh, in person. We first announced that to the public, I believe it was on July the 21st. And we allowed people to choose virtual really up until 
the end of the second week of school. Okay. Set a couple of deadlines, but we allow people to continue to shift over up until the second week of school, and we allow people to go back the other way through the end of the first week of school. But we had to stop that at a point because if we did not stop that at some point, then we could not calculate, can we safely bring, bra bring back pre-K, kindergarten, first or second grade? Because we've got to have a stable number to decide we can have this many in this room with this teacher and keep them six feet from each other and six feet from the teacher. And also trying to establish an environment where it's not the teacher having to sit like this all day, every day, to keep the six to keep the six feet some range of motion to move from here to the Promethean board to to back and forth and to come in and out of the room so it's more than just laying out so many square feet inside a box there has to be some ability to move there and to keep them from being in that proximity whether they wear a mask or not for more than 15 minutes and I think that's a it's somewhat of a nuance, but it's not subtle what the DHEC has straight out said to us. You've got somebody inside that 15 minutes, whether they're wearing a mask or not, when somebody's positive, they, they, are, to, they are to quarantine. All right, and then my last is, what are we doing to be better? I don't know how to say this. Um, I feel like the e-learning is an obstacle for many during this process and not only for students but for teachers and I, I'm trying to find out how we're going to make this e-learning better much better than what we're dealing with now right. I, I would answer your question and separate it out to make sure because I know you know what you're talking about I know what you're talking about but other people listening may not distinguish between e-learning and virtual. Virtual is what we talked about earlier. You go that 100% of the time. It's highly structured because there's a teacher assigned to that. They have more students than the ones in person, but there's a teacher assigned to that, and that's what they do. Right. Either all day at the elementary and middle school level or by period at the high school level. Uh, we, we have very few concerns or complaints about the virtual school program. We have concerns both that we hear from parents and students and concerns that we have about e-learning. Because when you think about that, we're asking those classroom teachers to teach two ways. To teach the ones in front of them and to teach those that are not able to be in front of them the three days they're not there. We have some teachers that have done a great job of that. They're more adept with technology. I've been in rooms where there's a teacher teaching a group sitting there live. They're, they're live streaming uh, video to one sitting at home watching them at home and they're recording it. every teacher's not yet at that level that's that, that, that's really we're, we're asking them to do two, two jobs in one so to speak now what we have done within the last week we have established a more structured framework and I'll send you that uh, Mr. McCoy and his staff have worked uh, with the principals on developing a more structured framework for the expectations of a teacher in e-learning. That I think will address some of those issues. Uh, we also are going to pull some of our virtual teachers for some very short periods to have them work with our academic specialists to develop some resources because this is the environment they work in every day to develop some resources that can then be adapted and used by our regular classroom teachers beyond the first nine weeks, which we have it out there for them for the first nine weeks. They have to add to it, but we have a framework out there for them. Those are the two big things we're doing, and we spent considerable time within the last week on working on structural improvements to increase and improve the quality and fidelity of what we're doing with e-learning. So these students that are taking AP traditional classroom that are having to teach themselves through e-learning and not scoring high enough on their weekly tests, which has become an insult to their intelligence since they've been doing very well all along. Are we holding them accountable to these 
grades that they're receiving due to them having to teach themselves during e-learning? We should not have students teaching themselves. So I, I need to know what particular student you're talking about or what particular teacher you're talking about. And I'm sure if, if, after we conclude this meeting, you'll let me know that. Be glad to. And so I, one, one thing I would say, what we're doing is a much improved version of what we did last year at the conclusion of last school year. And that would have been the time when we concluded last school year as far as in person and we shifted to e-learning. That was the critical period just before the AP exams and our student uh, success on AP exams improved last year. So, uh, but any individual concerns like that, we need to know where they are so they can be addressed. Okay. A lot of our AP classes, I believe, uh, Jeff, uh, we have teachers that are teaching them uh, in a dual manner, and you, you may want to speak directly to that. In some cases, yeah. In some cases, the, um, the high, if it's a single AP class, a singleton, like some of our schools that are, have AP certificates and all that, and in many cases, those classes, APs are streaming that content um, because there's no other way to work it out virtually because it was a singleton class. Um, the ones that may be more popular AP classes, AP human geography and those types of things, they, they may be more traditional, you know, in person on the days of attendance and then e-learning on the off days. That's what I'm talking about. Geography. Probably on the off. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's very difficult for younger students to adapt to that. That's great. Jeff, you'll let us know who that, again, to Dr. Roy's point, if you'll let us know who that is, when we can always, as we, as those issues come up, we work with the principal and the teachers to identify that and how to make that a better experience. I'd like for you just to talk for just a minute on when they're in the two day a week, the teacher has to do what for those students, those two days, and then when the students are not in the classroom, they're e-learning. So we're, and they're having to catch up on other days of material. So explain that so that the public understands. It should work two ways. Um, there's two options that teachers have, and it depends on the teachers, um, how, however they choose to structure their classroom. So one would be the flipped classroom model we've talked about before, where teachers may front load on their e-learning day. Um, they may front load um, content. So that might be videos the students would watch about a concept they're gonna, that they're learning about. And then that next day in class, um, the teachers would use, <clears throat> would structure activities that would actually incorporate what the students would have learned, and that allows the teacher to, um, you know, through those group, those activities, can't do as much group activity now because of the, the social distancing, but through activities, that allows that teacher to figure out what students may have struggled learning the content the day before, and then that allows her or him to do um, small group activities or individual work with those students on those low attendance days. The other um, side of that would be, or <clears throat> in a more traditional setting, um, the teacher, while they're teaching that face-to-face -face class, those students would be working on content um, on the e-learning at home. And again, that should incorporate things like um, videos that the teacher's pre-recorded um, for the, whether it be the live instruction she recorded for the class that day, or he or she could do pre-recorded videos, which many of our teachers are doing as well. So they're getting the same instruction, so to speak, but it's a, you know, it's verse video versus live instruction on those days kids are in attendance versus on e-learning. And at this point, um, Dr. Worcester, thank you for the explanation on all of those questions. Thank you. Um, Ms. Wells, and then Mr. Lewis, and then Mr. Um, Sailors. Thank you. I am very pleased to be able to support this motion because I did not want to see us move backward and particularly you know as you noted and as we discussed in our, our last meeting you know the concern with using a, a percent positive test when there's so much fluctuation in the number of tests that are given and the reasons they're given you know if you got a bunch of college students that are going back to school and they need to get tested with no symptoms um, versus at the beginning when you only could get a test if you had symptoms and a doctor ordered it so I'm, I'm appreciative of this um, I think what I heard you say, and I want to confirm, in the next 10 days, or, or in 10 days, we could expect to hear from you on the potential, the, the, what the preparations look like to get our youngest kids back in school five days a week? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And, and with, in terms of 
our attendance plans we've cur currently approved it in the framework there isn't anything that says before that that you couldn't go ahead and accelerate for special ed for CTE for those groups of students getting them back in prior to that 10 days five days a week if the logistics are working out for that uh, to, to maybe answer your question a little different way I, but I think this is what you were asking it would, it would not require us to come back to the board and ask right. for authority to do so. Uh, it, within our plan, we have the note, the notation, that even if you go back to the original approval you all did during the summer of this, there's a notation with that approval that that does not restrict us from bringing back individuals or groups to attend in larger days, greater number of days than the plan for the whole district. So, okay. no, you're, you're correct. So, can, then similarly, can I translate that to mean that there might be certain schools that, because of the size of the school and the size of the classroom, based on the number of teachers allocated or the size in general, that those schools might be able to start this sooner in terms of going back five days? The, the, only, the only way that, that we might consider doing something like that because of the equity issue would be if we felt like we needed to pilot it somewhere, okay. but we were also assured that space-wise we could do it other places. Uh, for example, uh, later this week we will meet back with those nine principals. Uh, they, they may propose, in fact, I, I know what a couple of them are going to propose, well, here's how I'm going to do it in my school because they've, they've already shared that with me. We might take a few of those and maybe take a Friday and let them do that at their school. So how does that work? You know, the, the, you, they come your Monday, Wednesday, your Tuesday, Thursday, but on Friday at that school, we might bring in this grade level. Let's see how that works. But we don't want, I believe we would create a huge equity issue because we do have a few schools that have a lot more room than others. We do have some varying class sizes, but we do not have class size variance to such a degree that we can get every student in the room keep six feet now we do have vacant rooms you start putting students in vacant rooms you have to have personnel to go with them there's an issue with that there is both an availability issue and a cost issue and the, okay. the bigger issue is the availability there is not as you all i know readily know there's not a surplus of quality teacher candidates out there we've been very fortunate in fact, I think when we get the final numbers, our retention rate this year is going to be very good as far as retaining teachers. But what we found, because this year we're, we've hired teachers later than we usually do, because we intentionally held off on hiring, because we didn't know how many students we'd have in virtual, and we wanted to try to hire teachers maybe more attuned to a virtual environment. So we were hiring a little bit later than we ordinarily hire in a little bit larger number and the pool of applicants for jobs where traditionally the pool is bigger primary and elementary the number of applicants was greatly reduced so we know there's not a pool of quality candidates out there are there some there are some but there's not enough to go wholesale and hire if we had to hire one more fourth grade teacher at every elementary school we would not find 51 fourth grade quality teachers at this point. Okay. Well, you, you sort of providing some information for the other question I was going to ask because to Ms. Leventus Wells questions on the e-learning, um, you, you know, what I have heard is that it, it's, it's difficult, particularly in those younger grades when students need to be learning independently, not that they're learning the content, not that they don't have content, but that it's right. difficult if that content's not being delivered by someone or they don't have a person checking in with them, particularly if they're sitting in a daycare setting. So I guess the question was going to be, do we, could we hire teachers or aides to help mitigate some of that lack of connection on those e-learning days for students, particularly for, if we believe this is going to, to be a thing where we're going to continue through this first semester with the two day a week e-learning right now that's a question that i would defer the answer to to later because i think at this point what we would want to do if we had access to additional resources 
And by access, I don't simply mean the ability to pay for it, because I'm sure we could come back to you all and we could use some of that CARES Act fund. It remains. Right. There, there's a little bit there, and there's fund balance. Uh, but I think the issue would be finding quality personnel. Uh, I think that right now our focus needs to be if we needed to hire two or three to facilitate getting students back in five days a week at the lowest grade levels. That's why we picked the levels we picked. That's where it's most critical for in-person instruction. It's important right. across the board. Right. Most critical where they're learning to read, to write. Kindergarten, by its number itself, class size number, that wouldn't be a place to start. It'd be easier to start somewhere else, but that's a more critical. If we had to choose between right. kindergarten and third grade, kindergarten more critical. Right. Right. So in some of these schools, for example, uh, we may have a, a school where they have some empty rooms in proximity or they can arrange it where there's an empty room directly across from the kindergarten and an existing aide might take six or eight students over there and then they shift them back and forth. Because you don't want them mingled with other students. That's another, we don't really talk that much about that, but essential at the elementary level because we can do it there with the greatest fidelity. You want to keep students together. So if you have exposures, you're limiting the number that are impacted by, now they're not sitting at home three days a week, they're sitting at home for 14 straight days. Uh, so we want to minimize that. Well, if it came down and we needed to hire a few more aides to make that work across the board, that's, I believe, now where we would get the most for investing that money, but more importantly, for using up whatever quality resource, personnel resource, that we have. And, and we, to a degree, will struggle to fill aid jobs as well. I think we've seen that, as I mentioned earlier, about the bus drivers and the food service workers. Well, and, and I believe if we probably have some people in the community that care enough about this that I think we'll, we could start asking them to step up, and I, I believe we'd see some of them step up to help with those. So that, that's my belief and, and my hope. Um, so then the only other question I'm going to ask is, you mentioned transportation. And so in thinking about that, because that would be a limitation if we got to meet that 67%, and then you're looking, we talked at the beginning of the year, you're looking at two bus routes, which is three hours, uh, maybe less since we don't have as many students. But and as part of that, are we, are we going to communicate with parents to find out, families to find out if they might opt out of transportation? I talked with a number of families who said, hey, if the buses are the issue, I'll carpool and coordinate, and I'll bring as many kids to school as I can on my own, um, with mask, of course. Uh, so, so are we going to get that feedback in case that's, if, that, if we see that as becoming a limiting factor, are we going to get feedback from the community and ask them for help in that way? Yes, to the, to the way you, you, you ended your question. We'd do that if we saw a need to do it. Uh, right now, to your point, our, our, for one, we got 30% of our population in virtual across the board. Now some schools, higher percent, we got some schools at 40 percent. Got 30 percent of the population in virtual. So that drops us obviously to 70 percent of our normal population. We're transporting only 50 percent of that 70 percent. 50 percent of what we'd normally transport. Okay. Yeah. But even within that, our, our students riding the bus has dropped below 50% of what you would forecast 50% to be based on last year's ridership. So that number's already down. Our buses are arriving on time. Uh, now, you know, we had a with time change. That, that's greatly helped that. They're arriving everywhere on time, absent of unusual breakdown traffic problem. And they're getting home earlier than they have ever gotten home before including the traditional longest routes of Magnet and the deaf and blind uh, shuttle bus. Uh, in fact, the Magnets, I believe, are getting home 20 minutes till 6, and they've never gotten back that, that early. But that's all related to the number of stops they're making primarily, right? Sorry? I mean, that's related to the number of stops that they're making because they don't, they're not running a full but exactly, route. Exactly. A, gr a great deal of that, right. that is. So we know we've got some capacity there. And based on them looking at this, 
just from a preliminary basis, at the grade levels we're talking about, they believe that we would not appreciably start routes earlier than they're regularly scheduled and would get the elementaries on time, but it might impact the secondary routes. But that's, a, that's just a, fir that's a first look. Okay, okay. And then you did say to, to be sure that our teachers are getting the help they need on the e-learning side, you did say that y'all are working with your virtual to provide a little more support. Because our teachers are stressed out. This is difficult for them with, the, with their families. And, and I think they don't feel like they're delivering what they need to deliver to their students, a lot of them, because they are, they are perfectionists and they want to give the right. students the best quality. So you're, we're getting them some more resources to help with the e-learning side of that. Is well, and, and there we run into that same problem, the availability of external resources, like people we could bring in. There just aren't people out there we could bring in. So what we're going to do, and we'll have to ask parents to bear with us on this a little bit, because it will involve some early release for our virtual teachers, maybe a couple of times, okay. as well as them spending an in-service day, to let them craft some things that can be used, not just in virtual, but really be crafted so they okay. can be used in e-learning. And that will take place in the next several weeks. Uh, that's the best resource we have. We, you know, we made a decision to do our development internally and to operate our system internally. I believe that was a, I believe that has been a very good decision based on what we have seen happen in districts both large and small where they have gone externally for resources and have had numerous difficulties, including the, the crashing of those resources. So it, it's more personnel intensive, but I believe that's why we've been able to deliver a much stronger, more robust product for virtual program. And I think it offers us the same opportunity to try to help support the e-learning. But that is the greatest challenge. Another great challenge that our teachers have, we have spent 10 years moving to a more engaging, different model of instruction. Yeah. And this does not lend itself to that. This, the, all these per requirements and parameters cause you to be the person standing up in front of the room delivering a directed lesson. Now they've done a great job finding innovative ways to, to get around that, but trying to innovate your way around something that's there, a barrier you didn't put there. It's not there because you don't want to do it differently. It's there because you can't do it differently. So that adds to that stress as well. But our teachers have done an incredible job. You know, when you go around and see them, you actually go in the classroom and you see what they're doing. They've done an incredible job balancing, I've got this group in front of me, I've got this group at home. Well, I appreciate it. I know that we're constantly evaluating like you guys always have, and I don't know that the community recognizes how, how hard the district is working to find all the ways they can to get students back in the classroom as much as possible. So thank you for that, and I look forward to supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Wells. At this time, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Dr. Royce, just a, a couple of questions. So the, the action that you're asking us to approve today is specifically to allow us to maintain a, a level two even though the, the conditions that we've approved in the past would have put us at, at one day a week or zero days a week. Is that yes, sir, that's correct. The, the conversation about five days a week for the 4K, 5K, first, possibly second grade students, um, the special ed students and the career center students, you, you believe that that action is already in the plan that we've already approved so the board doesn't have to approve that? Yes, sir, it requires this separate approval. And so, so it would be your understanding that we could move to that model without the board taking a, sep a separate action. Yes, sir. We could go ahead and do that. Yes, sir. And you expect in the next 10 days to have yes, kind of that, those plans fully fleshed yes, out? To be able to roll out uh, a, a timeline, m maybe have done some actual implementation within that 10 days. Uh, the one that's uh, probably will be the, the, the one that would, you would see first would be uh, the multiple days of attendance for uh, career center level two students. Okay. Because quite honestly, it's the easiest one to facilitate logistically. Okay. Um, having kids go back to school on Fridays would require us to reopen the buildings. Is that, is that correct? Yes. 
So would you envision that if, if we move to that, that we would also then be having teachers be able to come back on Fridays that are currently now working, working from home? Yes. Now that would predominantly be the 51 elementary schools. Okay. So once um, the elementary schools are back to five days, uh, if, if, we, back if five we move days, grade yeah. levels uh, within a school, even if it's just one, then we got to run HVAC systems okay. uh, to have those students there. Okay. And as you know, right now we're we're not doing that as a part of effort to conserve resources because we we know that we have not yet seen the the financial impact of the shutdown our state's experienced. I, I know that the, the plans aren't fully fleshed out yet, but are you envisioning that a first grade class is going to go back to school and all of those students are going to be in the same classroom? Or are, are you envisioning models where these, these kids are going to be spread out around the building? Are they, are they? If I, if I answer specifically your question, I would say you in the first grade, okay. we would expect them for the most part, I don't think there'd be a situation where they're not in the same room okay. because of first grade class size. Okay. I think in all other grades, though, Mr. Lewis, you might expect that they would not be in the same room all day and there'd be some amount of time uh, that they were in another room, maybe with an aide. And that's going to vary from school to school. It'll look differently from school to school. Uh, one of the things the principals talked about is because this is so different from what our youngest students normally do, you, you probably see them outside more frequently. They probably have more frequent recess than they ordinarily would have in a typical school day. So it, it will look different, but at the same time, keeping them apart and separate from other students so as not to create a situation where one student causes the quarantine of a student in a different class or a different grade level. The, um you know, that, the idea of getting, I agree with Ms. Wells, I mean, the idea of getting four, five, and six-year-olds back to school would, would remove a huge burden from, from our families, particularly because those are the students who need the most direct help from the parent while they're trying to do their, their remote learning. Yes, sir. Um, so then, of course, then the question comes, well, what about those 9, 10, and 11-year-olds? Why, why, why would we be looking at moving a portion of the elementary school back instead of just the entire elementary school? Well, the first thing would be if we prioritize bringing those youngest students back, in some cases we're going to take up and use those vacant rooms and we're going to use some resources. Okay. We know, the, we know, we reasonably know we can do that mathematically. Now we've got to go lay it out everywhere. When you get beyond that, the class sizes, and, and when we say large, we're they're not that, they're 23 and 24, but they won't fit six feet apart in a room and give the teacher six feet. We run into the problem of keeping them socially distanced and socially distanced from the teacher when we go above the first grade. So we'll look to go above the first grade as far as we could reasonably go before we exhaust our ability to do it. I also have to remember we have to get these students into the building and out of the building in a way that maintains distancing, doesn't expose them more than 15 minutes to somebody else. So, you know, and I think, you know, you all have seen or you have heard people relate how that looks now. Dismissal and arrival is much different. Well, they're handling it fine with half of them. When we start to add people back to that, then we have to gauge how well can they handle that and maintain the protocols. Because one thing that comes across very clearly, it's come across in parent focus groups when we've talked with them. It came across strongly within our teacher forum when we talked with them. We feel comfortable moving forward with face-to-face -face as long as the protocols you have are in place. And that becomes the challenge. Uh, as long as we have to maintain that six feet until we reach a level that public health authorities say that's not necessary or there's this other way you can mitigate it, then then I think it hampers our ability to go beyond where we're talking right now. But first we've got to see can we do this and can we do it in a way that maintains everybody's safety and health. Well, and I think you, um, you know, I, I think we, we celebrate what happened in the last few weeks that, that people were able to, to meet the protocols, both staff, students, and parents. And so the expectation that we could kind of use this as a phased-in approach as a next step towards moving those other grades in mm -hmm. sounds 
sounds encouraging to me. Um, the, I guess, I, I guess the, the question I wonder about is, you know, while we're talking about a phased in approach, there are there are members of the General Assembly who are talking about a resolution to to send us all back to school five days a week. Period. Um, looking at our buildings, could we could we maintain six feet social distancing? and the other protocols that we have in place that our staff have appreciated as safety measures and have all of our kids in all of our schools five days a week. Yes, sir. Is that all, Mr. Lewis? No, I, I, have, I have one more question uh, just about the um, special ed services. So, you, so you, you mentioned that uh, one of the groups that you would intend to see back more quickly to five days a week are, are, are students involved in our special ed programs. Mm -hmm. are, do you mean students with IEPs or do you mean students who are in like specifically initially self-contained? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Mr. Uh, Sailors. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Dr. Oyster, Mr. Lewis, and Mrs. Wells asked a number of my questions, but there's one thing I'd like for you to follow up on just for those that are not familiar with the numbers other than what you've shared. A typical Kindergarten, first grade classroom is how many square feet? Uh, typical kindergarten is 1,100. Uh, in our district, a typical first grade classroom would be anywhere from 810 to 850 square feet, probably more at 850 than are at 810. Okay, and then? And we have a few that are less than that in our oldest facilities. We've got some 750s in a handful of schools, although, as you all know, all of our schools were either recently built or they were renovated during best, but in a renovation, one thing you can't do is make the rooms, for the most part, you can't make rooms bigger. That so in some of our very oldest buildings, though renovated, they've got some 750 square foot rooms. So my point being is because of the differentials in physical space in those classrooms, you're not able to concretely say that we're going to be able to X until the staff goes, as you mentioned earlier, into every one of those classes that have been identified and physically draw out a map that fits for a class with X number of students. Right, and, and I know you, you asked that question, and, and, and you already know this answer that I'm going to give because of your, the, the background of what you do, but everybody doesn't necessarily you know, realize that, particularly those that might be watching or listening to this. When we say a classroom is 1,100 square feet or it's 850 square feet, they're not all arranged the same way. And although the room is that big, those rooms, particularly all the elementary rooms, but really rooms at any level, they have casework. I mean, they have built-ins that take away from that floor space. They also have, at the lowest grade levels, they have restrooms that inside the room, restrooms that take away from that space. Not only do you have the restroom there, you have the door swing out from it, you have the door swing into the hall, into the room, and all the pre-K and kindergarten classrooms have a second door to go straight outside, so you have to keep that area clear. Hence, having to go through and physically look at every room. So we make sure that we're not just saying, because it's 850 square feet, 16 people will fit in there with six feet around them. It is, it is, well, you answered my next question, so I'll just say this, that the situations that we face just answering those questions are definitely not one size fits all. That is correct, yes, um, sir. Next, another question that I have real quickly is, um, we've all received emails, phone calls, messages from members of the community sharing their concerns, and I think for the most part, we have all worked very diligently to answer those. Uh, either a call or an email. The, when, when all of this first started, you established a, for the lack of a better phrase, a hotline, mm -hmm. where parents and community leaders, teachers, could all call in, email, and share their concerns, their questions or comments, their ideas, whatever it may be. Can you share with us how many calls and emails we received during a given period of time? Uh, I, I've got a few numbers on that. We don't have it necessarily broken out just by the people that we had engaged with answering COVID-specific questions. Right. Because in most cases, they came, they might have come through the service center. 
but our service center, which is the primary number most people would call it, 355 mm -hmm. 3100 number, uh, we've received 43,183 calls since school started. Now, same period last year, 35,842. Okay. So I, I think you could reasonably attribute the uptick to the different environment. Uh, our ombudsman's office handled 1,600 uh, issues or incidents. Academics responded to about 1,000. Now, none of these are duplicated numbers. In our office, 1,750. Uh, info line email, 1,790. Uh, our virtual email, which is a separate setup, 8,855, and 1,084 Facebook Messenger responses. Now, we don't have them broken down by category, but what I can say to you is if you send us a question, we answer the question. So there are not any unanswered questions out there. If someone has written us solely with a comment, they get a response. Now, we have some people that frequently comment and say the same comment, they might not have gotten an individual response to each one of those, but they've gotten a response. Uh, help desk, which is which is our ETS response. And, you know, in a in a huge uh, technologically rich environment, they have closed 12,000 help desk calls, and they have 2,400 open, and they'll close out a significant number of those today. We watch those. What we watch inside that. Uh, would be re re repetitious, i.e. we know we have an issue with, with, with e-learning. We're working on that. We, we know that both by our observation, but we also know because a number of people have said that. So it becomes a common issue. So we look for commonality across calls or emails or whatever, whatever manner they use to communicate, and then we make sure that, that we really put forth a focused effort to address those things. And again, we're going to do the same thing with an individual problem. They call the ombudsman's office and they have some individual issue. They're going to follow up with it, the school, or the school's going to follow up with it, and the ombudsman's going to check back and see if it's been responded to. So uh, those numbers are, are up from a, from a normal year, but I think that's certainly to be expected because this is anything but a normal year. Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Sailors. Mr. Meek. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the recommendation that we have been following are the, uh, the low, medium, and high recommendations. And as you said earlier, they are recommendations from DHEC. They, uh, are, they do not say that any of it has to be mandatory. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. And it's a blending of the DHEC recommendations that align with the Accelerate Ed categorizations of high, medium, and low. D DHEC provides a definition for those uh, categories. Okay. And so by us, <clears throat> if we approve excuse me, if we approve this amendment today, then we would not be complying with DHEC's recommendation. Is that correct? We would be complying with every recommendation that DHEC has as to the safety of employees and students. We would not be aligning our plan that we put in place for alignment with low, medium, and high. They do not designate to you a day or percent of attendance. What, the, what their recommendations deal with are the protocols that we have in place. Okay. Does that make sense with me? Well, I mean, it might not make sense. Does as well as anything <laughs> makes sense these days. Um, you mentioned earlier that DHEC had said that we are following their guidelines that if a teacher was exposed with a student who was positive for 15 minutes or more with with or without a mask is that a recommendation or are we required for them to do that my take on that is that's a requirement 
So they do have quarantine and isolation. I take those to be requirements. Uh, DHEC has a statutory authority uh, where, where Doug go. Uh, they, they have a, a, a phrase for that. What, do, do you recall the particular phrase they have for it? But, it? but it basically has to do with infectious disease and their ability to tell you what to do. It's, it's exclusion. So an exclusion list, I think is what they refer to it as. So if we had more students in school and we had more positive cases in school where, where the teachers or whomever is exposed, then how are we looking at that? How are we going to address that? We might shut down a classroom. We might shut down a grade level. We might shut down a school. But as yet, we don't have, we have not seen that kind of exposure. And I believe, Mr. Meek, the reason we have not seen that is because of the plan and the protocols that we have in place that we shouldn't have that level of impact. Our, quite honestly, our greatest impact had been exposures outside of school in predominant number. There have been exposures from outside of school. Okay, on August the 4th, I think was when we approved the current attendance plan. Yes, this is what we presented to our employees that we were going to follow. Yes, if we approve this amendment today, are we uh, changing the plan that is that teachers and employees are coming back working with us? Are we changing the rules now in, in midstream? changing the plan, I would argue we're not changing the rules because we have the very same protocols in place in a two as we have in a one. And we now have the benefit of experience, which is knowledge we did not have when we put them in place before the year started. When uh, we met with the teacher forum uh, Friday, you know, those obviously the teachers of the year from every, every school in the district. And we asked them, about their comfort in returning to face-to-face -to -face. and the preponderance of them, uh, well, well in the upper 60 percent, were, were comfortable in returning to face-to-face -to -face. and we particularly asked them about five days a week. The caveat was maintaining all of our established protocols. But we're not able to do that if we come back to five days a week. Not able to do that at every grade level. If, if you all were to say to us, bring every student back five days a week tomorrow, we could not follow those protocols. And where we're looking at bringing students in five days a week, we're looking at it in alignment with following all those protocols. Okay. And you were talking earlier about bringing back certain grades at a time. Yes, sir. If, if you were to do that, then would you be allowed, allowing the virtual students to come back <coughs> early? I would think at that point we would likely not be able to do that because all of our calculations would be based on the number we have present in person today. So you're basing it upon the 66% of the students or whatever? To bring We're it basing back. it really on the ones who have chosen and stuck with being in bricks bricks and mortar. Okay, going to transportation. Why are we 70 drivers short? I would, I would think personally, you know, well, there's more people unemployed out there than, than normal. So why are we short bus drivers? I think there's anecdotally uh, the issue that people have been able to make more at home. That's, that's an issue. Uh, and one of the barriers that, uh, that the transportation people have shared with me within the last couple of weeks, they believe that the lack of 40 hours, ones we have that are leaving to go to other jobs, that that's a reason we're losing them. Uh, so though it's very early in this process and we have no idea what the budget will look like, if we, if we find support for that other than just anecdotally, one of the things that we've already uh, 
got finance looking at is what would it cost to move bus drivers to a 40 hour week. But we're experiencing the same difficulty. I have I did not talk with building services prior to this meeting. I'm gonna speculate they're having a similar issue. But food and nutrition services, which traditionally has not had a challenge getting a sufficient number of employees, they're again fifty some odd employees short. Okay, I could ask Many more, many more questions about that, but uh, I won't. So thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Meek. At this time, uh, Ms. Bush. Yes, ma'am. And uh, I think to even to add a little bit to what you said, if you go back and look at the very first document we issued, it has five days on it. It is, the, it is the intent from the outset to be in school five days a week when it is safe to do so. My, my experience from starting in a, in a classroom a number of years ago is now 41 years. Uh, I've not seen anything like this. Not, not, none of our generation, whether you look at us as a generation of, of educators or a generation of board members, no one's seen it. I don't think anything that compares to this. And I appreciate what so much what you said. I don't think people... It is easy to have an opinion, I think, when you are not the individuals, whether you be a trustee or an educator, who have the ethical, the moral, and the legal responsibility to ensure that we're doing the right thing for students and for employees. Uh, and we, I believe, have approached this. When I say we, I mean the administration and the board in a methodical, planned out manner with the ultimate goal of doing what is best for students, and that is them being present in school every day that they can possibly be there. 
but also what is best to protect the safety and the health of our employees and our students and our community. And I don't think there is anyone among us, whether that be a teacher in front of a classroom right now, a principal in a building, one of us at the district level, one of you as a board member, or anybody carrying out any job in the district that is not concerned, that is not worried, that is not challenged by the environment. But what with, without exception has happened is people have risen to that challenge. And they have done, I believe, the absolute best that they can do given the set of circumstances that we have all been handed. Circumstances not of our choosing nor of our making. But I believe we've responded in a way that reflects the ultimate in stewardship of that which has been entrusted to us. So thank you for saying that, Ms. Bush. able to get to that point of where we can 